I call myself the Mob Miner. Emulation runs in my veins. It's as much a part of me as a turbo button, a different turbo button, or India Pale Ale. Emulating an arcade game or a system is always an adventure. There are mysteries to solve, challenges to overcome, and stories to tell. I've dealt with my fair share of them over the years, so without further ado, today we're going to talk about the history, the failure, and the emulation of Konami's Polygonet Commanders. Let's take a trip back to the early 90s. The Super Nintendo debuted at the end of the previous year, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was in its first season, and 3D was slated to be the next big thing. Disney's film, Tron, was released a decade prior in 1982 using pre-rendered 3D graphics, which were unlike anything anyone had seen before. In the decade that followed, CPU speed and RAM capacity had grown rapidly. What had required a room-sized mainframe to render could now be done almost in real time on desk-side workstations made by companies like Silicon Graphics. It wasn't long before companies at the cutting edge of consumer entertainment wanted to give people a taste of the future. Namco were the first company to attempt real-time, flat-shaded 3D graphics in an arcade game. Winning Run was released in 1988, instantly leaving a mark on future plans for the industry. It had two 12 MHz Motorola 68000 CPUs for main program duties. Graphics-wise, it had another Motorola 68K for high-level graphical tasks. In charge of turning models into polygons was a Texas Instruments 32025 digital signal processor. A DSP is effectively a CPU with special turbocharged math functions. According to industry briefs, it could push up to 60,000 polygons per second. Not too much if you want a playable frame rate, but respectable for something that came out when I was a toddler. For the final stage, turning polygons into pixels, Namco used a gargantuan amount of custom chips, which is a habit that they began in the 80s and kept on into the late 90s. Winning Run also got in on the ground floor of a newer, higher resolution standard that was starting to take shape, called Medium Resolution. While most arcade games at the time topped out at around 320 by 240 pixels, Medium Resolution pushed things upward to around 512 pixels horizontally by 384 pixels vertically, over two and a half times more pixels to fill. Apart from Winning Run, other titles included Starblade, released in 1991, which I'm sure didn't inspire 1993's Star Fox, or Star Wing for the Europeans, at all. Air Combat followed in 1992, which led to the Ace Combat series, which continues to this day. Atari followed suit a year later with Hard Driven, a game that absolutely screams Murica, with stunts, muscle cars, and barns galore. It also used a CPU from the Motorola 68000 series for game logic. It was unique also in having a Texas Instruments 34000 series DSP to handle car physics calculations. Kind of a late 80s NVIDIA physics if you think about it. For graphics, it had two additional TI-34000 series DSPs at around 50 MHz, with one handling the geometry and another handling drawing duties. As far as I can tell, Hard Driven was unique in this era by doing all of the polygon drawing in software on a dedicated DSP. The frame rate also wasn't fantastic, but like Namco's hardware, it ran at medium resolution, pushing 508 by 384 pixels per frame. By 1992, Sega entered the 3D fray while dominating the US market as Atari lagged behind. They created a board known as Model 1, which sported a total of five Fujitsu DSPs for geometry calculations, plus custom Sega chips to fill in the flat-shaded polygons. Each Fujitsu DSP was clocked at 16 MHz. The main CPU, for game logic, eschewed the more common Motorola solution and went with an NEC V60, which was nearly unheard of at the time, and pretty much still is to this day. The display resolution was 496 by 384 pixels, which also made it a medium resolution platform. This hardware formed the basis of the 3D games that would launch Sega into the 90s. Virtual Racing was the first title to come out on this platform in 1992, with local cabinet link-up for up to eight players, plus a ninth chase view, featuring an announcer called Vert McPolygon. Virtua Fighter came out in 1993, and it was the originating point of 3D fighting games as a genre, and it still receives sequels to this day. 
Star Wars Arcade came out in 1993 and Wing War in 1994, which were two aerial combat games that are still fondly remembered. Riding high on successes like Frogger, Gradius, Contra, Herodias, and Castlevania, Konami wanted in on this early 3D market as well. In 1993, I guess the train from Tokyo to Osaka was delayed, Konami made their first foray into flat-shaded 3D. Unlike other titles that focused primarily on racing and space combat, the two games to run on their board were tailored to their specific markets. Polygonet Commanders was made for the US market specifically. It was a first-person battle arena game with four-cabinet link play set across multiple stages where the player had to destroy a certain number of enemy tanks in the allotted time. It was a spiritual successor to Battlezone in a way. The music had a military-esque emphasis on marches and percussion. Polynet Warriors, meanwhile, was made for Japan. While keeping the link play and battle arena mechanics, you were instead one of many adorable, super deformed anime style characters shooting the <laughs> out of each other in first person. Destroy your enemies, move to the next stage, and so on. With an upbeat synth poppy soundtrack, it was an absolute recipe for success. Both games failed horribly. Why? My personal theory is that although hardware capabilities don't make a game, they've certainly sold their fair share of cabinets in their day. Unlike contemporary offers from other companies, Polygonet Commanders ran on what's known as a standard resolution monitor. It was low resolution enough that the dreaded jaggies could be seen, and seen they were as the frame rate was abysmal compared to Namco or Sega's machines. Polygonet was based on a mouthful of a CPU, the Motorola 68EC020 at 16 MHz. This was a faster and more capable chip than on competing boards. No problem there. Graphics, on the other hand, were a different story. Konami went with a Motorola DSP56156, a member of the venerable DSP56K line. An earlier model had already established itself as a mathematical powerhouse, driving audio on Silicon Graphics workstations, and even Steve Jobs' Next Cube, which came out in 1990. The DSP was tasked, like competing systems, with processing models into individual pieces of geometry to be rendered by other hardware. The problem is, it was the only one doing that. It also had the unenviable job of not just processing each model into a batch of primitives, but it had to step along the edges of each primitive, since the only acceleration that was provided was from some Konami customs to fill in a horizontal span of pixels. Unloved, gone, and nearly forgotten, Polygonet Commanders and Polynet Warriors fell by the wayside, most likely written off later as a Battlezone-inspired fever dream by the few who played it. In May of 2003, a ROM dump of Polygonet Commanders surfaced and was added without much fanfare to MAME. Notably little fanfare, in fact, as this was during the development of MAME 0.69. Nice. When what were known as test drivers still existed. This is a story unto itself, but to not digress too far while still clarifying, during the first six years or so of MAME's existence, completely non-functional systems tended to be omitted from releases. The source code existed for what fragmentary support there was, but they were marked as test drivers and so they were excluded when compiling release builds. This had the intended result of users not complaining about not working games, but also the unintended result of making it harder for people to contribute. You see, complete archives of all ROM sets supported by MAME have always been what people tend to distribute, so it was nearly impossible as an external developer to find the ROM sets for these test drivers. In October of 2003, with the release of MAME 0.75, the decision was made to enable all of the test drivers but mark them as not working. Users have widely regarded this as an annoyance and complain about it to this day, but ensuring that data doesn't get lost due to lack of distribution balances that out. Back to Polygonet. When the initial test driver was added, MAME entirely lacked support for the DSP56156. Emulation for the audio board wasn't hooked up correctly either, so the best you could do was hack around the initial self-test, which failed from both the lack of a working DSP and audio board, 
and then see the game complain about the lack of network hardware as well. With the release of MAME 0.100 in September of 2005, a MAME developer by the name of Andrew Gardner set his sights on Polygonet. He had, and still has, an affinity for 3D hardware and considerable experience along those lines. Although the game continued to fail its power on self-test, or post, Andrew was still toiling away and managed to emulate a large chunk of the DSP. The first major change to the driver itself was with MAME 0.107 in July of 2006, when a hack to skip the DSP RAM test was removed. This had the intended but unimpressive effect of MAME crashing instead when the DSP finally ran into code that it couldn't handle yet. With MAME 0.135 in October of 2009, the game booted past its post for the first time, although there was no visible 3D. MAME 0.140 in October of 2010 marked a complete rewrite of the disassembler for the DSP, exactly matching the official DSP 56156 simulator. More on that later. Other than Polynet Warriors being dumped and added for MAME 0.133 in July of 2009, this was where things stalled. For over a decade. Since joining the game industry in mid-2005, I've found that my motivation to work on MAME tends to increase proportionally to my day job workload. Call it irony, call it a self-destructive streak, call it fate, call it luck, call it karma. But I prefer to call it a way to keep my mind sharp while avoiding monotony. As things ramped up at work in preparation for a pre-midsummer milestone, I was looking for something to do on MAME as I had just hit a good stopping point on something else. My mind wandered over to Andrew's now dormant MAME development blog. In October of 2009, he had decoded some geometry data that was uploaded to the DSP by the main CPU. The DSP could pass the RAM test, add valid 3D data in its RAM banks, well, how hard could it be? This kicked off three weeks of tedium. Think of watching paint dry on growing grass. I first wanted to verify that the DSP was accessing RAM correctly. The exact layout of the RAM that the DSP could access wasn't entirely clear, because it uses a bank switching method to page nearly a megabyte of RAM within multiple slots of a 64 kilobyte window. Think of it like a multi-CD changer. You know that it has five slots, and you know what CDs are in there. But if you're going to queue up a track when your girlfriend's over, you probably want to know that Dollar Mendy's Tunak Tunak Tune single is in slot 3 and not Johnny McGovern. Unfortunately, verifying a RAM test routine isn't as simple as just ejecting a CD tray. It took hours of stepping instruction by instruction, jotting down the behavior of each one until the entire RAM test was written in something resembling C. At that point, I could study it and work out what it was doing. Once that was solid, the next critical task was to figure out how badly the DSP crashed and burned when processing models. If working through the RAM test was like watching grass grow, this was a level beyond that, like watching rocks grow. The code to process a batch of models into a list of spans to fill takes around 1,800 words of memory. With an average density of 1.5 words per instruction, that's still around 1,200 instructions to deal with, in code that has a tragically large number of loops. Since the goal was to figure out which instructions were going wrong and when, all I could do was step over one instruction, sanity check what it did, and only move on if it seemed sensible. Over and over, for hours at a time, for days at a stretch, only interrupted for food, sleep, and toilet breaks. Fortunately, the first critical fix was already documented, it just took me a day to notice it. There was a note at the top of the DSP core in MAME, which mentioned that the programmer's manual for the DSP had errata listed for one of the bitfield-related instructions. Essentially, the description of this instruction in the manual was wrong, and so they documented the correction to it way down at the bottom of the manual. Why exactly they didn't just edit the PDF before publishing it online, I have no idea. This specific errata pertained to how and when a certain status flag is set based on the instruction's result, and the geometry code makes frequent use of that functionality. It turned out that the DSP just wasn't processing any models to begin with. Life is never easy, and this bug turned out to be load-bearing. What that means is, its existence was obfuscating bugs in two other instructions. Instead of graphics springing gloriously to life, fixing that first instruction made the RAM test fail instead. 
This was when my earlier decision to document the RAM test paid off, as it made short work of tracking down the faulty instructions. For about three weeks, bugs were found and fixes were written at a relatively even cadence this past June of 2022. The bugs were plentiful, but manageable. One week into that, I noticed that the DSP was no longer silent, and instead started to scribble data back in the direction of the 68000, which was exciting, to say the least. On a hunch, I threw together some code to render the data into a bitmap, and I saw... this. Alright, so it's not exactly what it should look like, and the frame rate is even worse than it should be, but there's clearly something meaningful in there. After two more weeks of fixes with no visible changes, frustration set in. It wasn't apparent when an instruction was wrong, since everything seemed to be sensible. The Motorola DSP 56156 was not designed by sensible people. It was, however, supported by sensible people, since Motorola had the presence of mind to publish their own closed-source simulator. Despite being from the very early 90s, it worked. On a 64-bit install of Windows 10 in the year of our Lord 2022, I was running this emulator dating back to the first half of the 90s. I'd like to say that this made things far less tedious, far more interactive, and it became an absolute walk in the park. I'd like to say that, but it would be a lie. Not only did I now have to step through the DSP code in MAME, but I then had to tab over to the Motorola simulator and do the exact same thing for every single instruction. On the bright side, this revealed even more bugs. I grew frustrated yet again when I found myself at another plateau, finding no bugs while still having massive rendering issues. At this point, this is what the game looked like. It's rather improved, but pretty far from perfect. But at 3 in the morning, on Saturday the 25th of June 2022, I had a brainwave. How does a 3D system that doesn't even have depth buffering, which prevents further back geometry from overriding closer geometry, handle that? Turns out, it handles it easily, it draws everything front to back, and it just doesn't fill in any pixels that have already been written that frame. With that fix in place, Polygon at Commanders hit the point that it's currently at today. There's one remaining graphical bug. Some portions of the player's tank will disappear occasionally. However, this does not affect the playability of the game, and I'll eventually track it down. The 48 hours immediately following the DSP being mostly finalized kicked off a flurry of activity across multiple MAME developers. Each one assisted in polishing up the areas in which they were the most familiar. There was an almost wistful quality to it, since it echoed the early 2000s era of MAME development, when most devs were younger, hipper, and had fewer obligations that come with adulthood. With that in mind, I'm going to round out this video with appropriate kudos to everyone who has contributed in some way to emulating Polygonet Commanders. Olivier O.G. Galibert, Resident Konami Expert Number 1 and Everything Else Expert 2. This man has a to-do list even longer than my own, and the patience of a saint. He provided fixes for the 2D layer of the hardware. R. Belmont, Resident Konami Expert Number 2. He wrote the initial test driver, worked out 99% of the audio, palette, and EEPROM hookups, and did a good first pass on the 2D graphics. Andrew A.J.G. Gardner. The resident 3D and DSP genius with a knack for having leaps of inspiration when not getting sidetracked. He wrote a DSP 56156 core twice, with the second one having a high enough quality to merit debugging rather than another rewrite. Uki, Japanese game dumper, contributed the existing dump of Polynet Warriors and never made any fuss that it took so long to get it up and running. Uncle Phil Bennett. After partly retiring from MAME in favor of Enjoying Life and Arcade PCB Collection, he had the foresight to record footage of both Polygonet Commanders and Polynet Warriors. Without that, I would have had no reference material and probably wouldn't have embarked on this crazy journey. Still, he rose from his grave to help work out the audio interrupt issue that was preventing Polynet Warriors from starting, and he contributed 2D fixes as well. Hap. He took a break from emulating truckloads of vintage handhelds to provide moral support, as well as give the first hint that the reason why Polynet Warriors was hanging was an audio interrupt issue. David Mamehaze Haywood, 
former MAME maintainer turned MAME promoter, external developer, and handheld game slash fruit machine champion. He provided additional moral support, as well as even more 2D fixes. In particular, he solved an issue with the background layer having incorrect colors between rounds on both games. Hi, Dragon. He managed to annoy me to a sufficient level as to rewrite the LAN Link skeleton device emulation so it could be used with the Polygonet driver. Happy. The quintessential quiet wizard-looking fellow sitting off in a corner and waiting to dispense genius-level insight as needed. He wrote the high-level summary documentation on how the DSP geometry processing code works. The Santa Vas Crab. When not providing on-point code reviews of pull requests, he was inspired by the ugliness of MAME's endian swapping macros, and he wrote a tidy, templatized utility class to manage endian swapping on array axes instead. This video is more than long enough at this point, so it's time to pack it in for now. Feel free to chip in via Patreon, like, or subscribe if you've enjoyed either this video or the emulation of Polygonet Commanders, but I don't live or die by it. Do your thing, be chill, and I'll catch you with the next one. Peace. Virtua Racing came out in 1992, with local cabinet link-up for up to eight players, plus a ninth chase view featuring Bert McPolygon, the... <laughs> fuck.